second part of the story, of course, is what happens once the heat has moved into the building. That is the focus of this part of our training. It's about storage and sensation of heat experienced by occupants and surfaces inside. Heat is stored in two forms. One is sensible heat, which is the heat that can be sensed by a, a human being, for instance. The second part of heat, which is not really in that sense sensible or experienceable in a direct form, is called latent heat. As uh, we might have uh, learnt during you know, high school physics, etc., latent heat is the amount of heat or the quantity of heat that is stored in a object or a body because of its physical state. So for example, the amount of latent heat being stored in a gas is different from the amount of latent heat being stored in the same materials other form which is for example a liquid or a solid and we'll look at that in a short while. Sensible heat as we just said can be sensed. You would need a thermometer to be able to measure this for example. Latent heat in that sense can't be directly sensed with a, th with a thermometer. Also latent heat addition or subtraction from a body does not change the temperature of the object, it only changes the phase of the object, which means I can have uh, ice at 0 degrees and I can have water at 0 degrees. They both will have the same temperature, but they will have vastly differing amounts of latent heat stored in the molecules. Right? And we'll delve into this a little bit deeper from here on. Yes, this just reiterates the point when the air temperature increases, sensible heat increases. When moisture in the air increases, latent heat increases. When an object absorbs heat, the temperature increases, that's called sensible heat. And it is a function of the temperature and the mass of the object. Which means that if you have two objects at the same temperature, the one that has more mass actually has a total, a higher total amount of sensible heat energy contained in it. So this actually is an extensive property. It indicates the total amount of something. So the more of that something that you have, the more total heat uh, it contains. So let's understand that through a short quiz. Here is a question for all of us. There are two objects, both, at, both are the same size, as you can tell from the the visual representation there's object A, object B, they have the same mass say for example, say both of them are 10 kgs. This object is kept at a lower temperature than this one. The question is which object will have higher sensible heat and why? The answer of course is this object, object B has higher total sensible heat because even though they have the same amount of substance this one has that same substance's molecules vibrating at a higher uh, frequency, for example, which means that this object is going to be warmer, it'll have more total energy to give, right? Um, hence, this object, even though it has the same mass, has higher total sensible heat. <laughs> Another nuance of this, uh, of this uh, facet of sensible heat, here you have two objects at the same temperature, whereas this one on the right has more total mass, which is indicated by a larger area in this case. Which object will have the higher sensible heat and what is the reason for that? As we can see, the second object here on the right is the one that has total quantity, whose total quantity of heat is higher than the, the other one. And that's because of the fact that even though each molecule, for example, will have the same amount of energy, there are more molecules in this object. There's more stuff in this object and hence the total quantity of heat is more in this case versus this case. So this is actually um, quite a difficult concept sometimes for people to, to, to fathom and this can have a lot of significant um, implications on building design. For example, if you have a large body which is at a low temperature, right? So say for example you have a, a lake which is at 20 degrees temperature. 
versus say you have a small pond with boiling water. Uh, most conventional uh, thinking would lead to the conclusion that the boiling water in the pond has more energy than the energy of that lake because most people equate energy with temperature. However, there is a point at which you can have a lake large enough with a very very low temperature where the total amount of energy is much more than say perhaps even the energy contained in a, a volcanic eruption. So these are uh, uh, you know difficult abstract concepts to, to hold together simultaneously but let's keep in mind that sensible heat is, is about the total quantity of heat not about the temperature only. Yes temperature does affect it but what eventually governs is the total quantity of heat energy. Going more uh, into real life examples of the kinds of heat that is experienced by buildings and by, by persons going away from those abstract ideas of two objects. Let's look at a material that is commonly encountered by buildings and occupants um, and it directly influences the energy consumption of our cooling systems for example is water in different forms. And we look at the latent and sensible heat quantities in different forms in the next slide. All right, so first let's look at what happens when ice at negative one degrees goes to zero degree ice, which means it's on the cusp of now melting into water, right? This is a very well-known constant, which is the specific heat capacity of water, which indicates the amount of energy that you need to provide this one gram of ice, for example, to raise its temperature by one degrees. If I put 4.2 joules of energy into that one gram, of ice, it will raise its temperature by one degree. So this is a way I can get it from a negative temperature state to zero temperature or zero degrees, which is now at the melting point, which is at the, at the moment at which all the molecules start, you know, dispersing and becoming uh, liquid molecules. All right. So this is the first step. You take water from negative one to a point where it's ready to start melting. At that point, because now the whole uh, phenomenon is not about increasing the temperature, this is now about breaking those bonds and making them fluid, right? This requires a lot more energy, as you can see, per gram compared to the amount of energy that was required to raise it by just one degree. This indicates that the latent heat usually is a dominant factor compared to the sensible energy that is contained in an object, right? So when I add all this energy 4.2, 4.2 every degree, that only increases the sensible heat component. And as you can see, I have to add a lot of sensible heat for it to come close to the amount of latent heat that is involved in the change of physical state or the phase. I can then keep adding more sensible heat in this case to take this ice and make it water at zero degrees and beyond, right? So this is water at zero degrees, which has absorbed all the latent heat. And now I am adding more heat to keep increasing the temperature from zero to one. And I can do this so on and so forth till I reach boiling point. And as you can see, again, the specific heat capacity and hence the sensible heat component is a fraction of the latent heat energy. Taking the story further, I have taken the water now the liquid water and kept adding sensible heat energy into it to bring it to almost boiling point. At this state, it is now going to convert or take the next big jump in its story and it's going to become gas. As you can imagine, the amount of energy that I now need to provide to break those final bonds and make it uh, liberated in a way to allow it to, to start evaporating or, uh, or boiling is quite high and we'll look at that value in a bit. This energy is called the latent heat of vaporization and this becomes a pivotal factor in the design of air conditioning systems which we will address in a short while. So the first process of latent heat absorption was called the latent heat of, uh, of uh, fusion or it's called melting. This one is the latent heat of evaporation and we'll see the relative values and how significant they are compared to each other. 
If you remember the latent heat of fusion, that was about 334 joules of energy per gram to just change the uh, state there. This one is much more dramatic. The amount of energy that I need at this stage is 2260 joules per gram of water. If that eventually becomes steam or vapor, we can imagine that each of these molecules has contained in it so much amount of sensible heat to take it from a negative temperature state to about 100 degrees. However, it pales in comparison to the amount of latent heat it has absorbed in two steps. One is in the, uh, in the conversion of ice into water and now from water into gas, right? If we have to deal with this, which is basically humidity, right? So when we get into understanding psychrometrics and design of cooling systems, we will see that this guy becomes a very formidable foe. It has, even though it looks benign, it has a lot of energy that we must now somehow reject and keep the building cool, right? So this statement here just says that it takes six times more energy to create steam compared to just creating water from ice. Right. This uh, lays out the whole story in one snapshot, latent heat of fusion, specific heat of water, this is all the sensible component, this is the next big jump and this molecule contains the energy that has uh, gone into its creation uh, in, a, in a relatively benign state in the sense that its temperature is the same as this but it has a lot of hidden factors which uh, eventually become manifest when we deal with cooling systems. So this was a story going for forward, right? Which is from ice into water into steam. Obviously, when you reverse that story, which is you try to take it back into its historical journey, you can imagine that for this to become this, it will have to lose all that energy that it, that it had acquired. And this is why when you try to condense water, which is what an air conditioner, for example, does, there's a lot of release of energy to be able to get it back into water and then take it out of the room, right? That's the method that we use in conventional air conditioning. And one of the reasons why ACs consume a lot of energy, not just the temperature, it's this condensation part. So the question is, is energy released or absorbed in going in this direction? So going forward, it of course absorbs a lot of energy. All of that has to be re-released to get you back into a earlier part of its, of its evolution. Right. This uh, just emphasizes that same point that we made about air conditioning. A lot of uh, you know, practitioners have difficulty understanding how condensation of water actually is a heat release process because there is no obvious sort of wave of heat that we feel when water condenses or water vapor condenses on a surface. In the building context, the way this manifests itself is actually the processes of a cooling system. A cooling system deals with two things. One is the temperature that is being sensed, which is a sensible heat, which means that if, say for example, a window is open and there's sunlight coming in, that will add to the sensible heat component. The other one, the other heat component as we saw right at the beginning, is called latent heat. How does a latent heat situation manifest itself in the case of a building? It happens through the working of a air conditioner, for example. So, have we ever observed that air conditioners actually have this spout or a tube that conveys condensed water from the space into the outside, right? That tube is actually the condensed or the, the tube contains the water that has been condensed from the ambient space by providing a cool surface inside the AC. Now to the naked eye or to a person just using te temperature thermometers or even just their own sensory experience, there will be no release of heat that they will be able to really sense. Nonetheless, there is a lot of release of heat going on in that air conditioner when the condensation process is going on. Which is why you can have an air conditioner working in two rooms, both at the same air temperature, which means if you use a thermometer, they both will show, say for example, 30 degrees. However, one AC operating in, is operating in, say, Chennai, 
and another one is operating in, for example, say Pune or a Jaipur, a dry place. Both those ACs dealing with the same temperature but different levels of humidity would actually use different amounts of energy to cool the space. The one in Chennai will have to deal with all that condensed energy in addition to the amount of sensible energy that is available or is being uh, brought into the room through the window, for example. So, that is latent heat in practice. It's that tube that is carrying the water out into the, uh, the other side of the building, which is a representation of all the energy that has been released and was absorbed by the air conditioner and then you know, worked around through its vapor compression cycle, which we will get into later. Um, this just reiterates the idea that essentially an air conditioner is a large dehumidifier and which is why more than just looking at the temperature we must pay attention to the humidity in a region to be able to estimate how much energy the air conditioner will actually require to expend to cool the space down adequately. If you have further questions please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.